Number 10. Roman Laundry Detergent So my washing machine broke this past week, which was a pain in the neck. Worst thing about it was that it broke in the middle of a load, so I had to wash the rest by hand, which made me glad we have washing machines at all. However, the Romans were a little more simplistic with their methods of cleansing the cloth. Apparently, vessels were set out in the streets of Rome for anyone to just walk up to and relieve themselves into, and once full, they'd be taken down to the local laundromat. From there, workers would mix the vats with water and pour the combo onto their patron's clothes, proceeding to stamp the clothes until clean. Yeah, sure, clean. Number 9. The Fall of Drusus In the case of historical poisonings, it's hard to determine whether or not they were actually poisoned or just died from being old. It's usually that they're old. But in the case of Drusus, the evidence was a little bit more clear. See, Drusus Julius Caesar was set to be the heir to Tiberius due to familial relations. His buddy Sejanus would have normally been the one to get the title, but blood is thicker than water. As a result, Sejanus tried to marry his daughter to Drusus' son, but that fell through. Sejanus was still determined to become the heir to Tiberius by whatever means necessary. This led to the two infighting frequently, and Sejanus eventually managed to seduce Drusus' wife, Lavilla, who aided him in poisoning her husband, slowly killing him in a way that appeared to be natural. And he got away with it. Sejanus continued to rise to power until his sudden and brutal execution, which was later revealed to be due to someone leaking the truth about his rise to Tiberius. Man, this just needs to be a telenovela. Number 8. The Crassus Cocktail ah, I love a good drink at the end of the day. Just getting a little mix here and there, it's just so fun. Ooh, if it's good, man. Just caps off a hard day of work. It seems like Crassus was a man of similar taste. A general and a statesman who'd earned the title the richest man in Rome. Dude ran a bunch of wars, serious campaigns, and his last was against the Parthians, primarily because he was just kind of bent out of shape that the other generals were outshining him in the field. Unfortunately, Crassus's forces were absolutely slaughtered, and when his son Publius ended up being one of the casualties of war, Crassus went to parley. Negotiations went sour, and he and his entire party were wiped out. Apparently, after such a rough day, the Parthians figured that Crassus could use a little something to take the edge off, so they had him take a sip of molten gold. Fun fact, the uh, melting point of gold is about 1064 degrees Celsius. Yeah, that'll have a kick. Number 7. Decimation. You've likely heard the term before used to describe the impact of some tragedy or another. However, the word actually has its roots in the Roman military, though its origin is a little different from how you might imagine. See, as I'm sure you know, the Roman military was infamous for its discipline and strategy. But if you've ever worked in any space with more than 10 people, you know it's hard to keep everyone in line. So how did the Romans do it? Simple. If one squad member screws up, the entire higher unit gets the punishment. Decimation roughly translates to removal of a tenth. The cohort would be divvied up into ten groups, and each group would draw lots. The group with the shortest straws were then executed by the other nine by whatever method was determined by their commander. The nine of the surviving groups were then made to survive off barley, and if they had to relieve themselves, it would be outside of the camp security. You know what? Maybe the military life just ain't for me. Number six. The Fall of Emperor Valerian One of the later emperors of Rome, Valerian rose to power simply and ruled simply. Went to war a few times, killed a bunch of Christians, got beat up by Goths, basic Roman stuff. So when Valerian was captured by Cameo of Shapur I, it boggles the mind why they went as far as they did in making sure that this dude wasn't just defeated, they made sure his entire genetic code wouldn't survive the humiliation he received. First on the menu was for the Shapur to use him as a footstool while mounting their horses. He was then given the Crassus Special, a big old bowl of molten gold right down the gullet, which may or may not have happened while he was simultaneously being 
burned alive. His skin was then allegedly stuffed with straw and died, hung in the Persian temple for all to see. Seriously, the dude just didn't like Christians. Chill. Number 5. Gaius Valerius Catullus Rap Battle Who doesn't love a good beef? Now, Catullus was a major poet, his works moving away from the retelling of classic tales and focusing more on the telling of day-to-day -day life. The personal nature of his works have lived in the minds of thousands, depicting humor, romance, and the beauty of day-to-day -day life. However, Catullus was no stranger to critics, two of his biggest being another poet, Furious, and Senator Aurelius. Now, constructive critique can be wonderful for artists. After all, it's the only way that you can improve. However, Catullus seemed to take a different view, writing a poem in dedication to his critics. Commonly referred to as Catullus 16, this poem was so filthy that it wasn't fully translated until the 20th century, and even then, several lines were heavily censored in most publications. Wanna hear it? Well, it reads. Number 4. Roman Birth Control Romans were… well, they got around a lot. Now, unless you want to deal with the immediate consequences of a whole lot of lovin', you've got to figure out a way to stay safe. Picking up condoms from a shopper's wasn't really a thing, and Plan B hadn't been invented yet, so what was the plan? Well, it turned out that the Romans had discovered an herb called silphium, which supposedly had contraceptive properties. Whether or not that's actually true remains to be seen, specifically due to the fact that you can't find it anymore. That's right, the Romans were so raunchy, and silphium was so popular popular that they caused the complete extinction of the plant, the last stock of it reportedly being given to Emperor Nero. Now in 2020, there has been a theory presented that there is a similar herb, or a relative, found in Turkey, and it could be the surviving relative of the plant, but to this day, not a sprig of silphium has been found. Apparently, it looks like a heart though. Aww, ecological devastation. Number 3. Roman Baths the terms made its way around. Roman baths are synonymous with the country and culture as a symbol of civilization. But you've listened to enough of this list so far, so you can probably figure out where this is going. See, while Romans were known for their hygiene, urine laundry aside, they were usually pretty nasty when it came to bath time. Soap wasn't really a thing, so the baths were basically just huge vats of oil that they just slather up all in there. Now these oils were perfumed, but they were also reused used frequently and were washed off using a strigil, a sort of scraping tool, so you know, just spoon the dirt off. Ugh. Number 2. Cato the Younger All right. Here's a fun one. Marcus Porcius Cato, also known as Cato the Younger, was a Roman senator in the later years of Rome. A hugely influential man, his life was fraught with turmoil and strife. He was also a strong opposer of Julius Caesar's Hellenistic principles. Uh, Cato had no trouble joining the opposition on the brewing civil war. Now, during that civil war, Cato took command of a campaign in Utica, a tough campaign that he generally just planned to abandon alongside the Roman Empire. However, one once they'd been defeated, Caesar moved to pardon Cato's family and allies. Convinced his end was drawing near, Cato took his life against his friends and family's advice, stabbing himself in the abdomen. Now, Some accounts claim that he actually drew out his own entrails from his body when the physicians attempted to heal him, ensuring that he wouldn't see Caesar's Rome. And maybe he knew that Caesar was planning to pardon him as well, which Cato would have considered the crueler punishment. Number one. Caligula's horse. Ah, we'd be remiss not to talk about the antics of Emperor Caligula. Famed for his strange ways, one of the greatest legends of an already infamous emperor was his attempt to have his favored horse, Incitatus, enlisted as a consul. According to Suetonius's Lives of the Twelve Caesars, this horse was dressed in lush finery, inviting dignitaries to dinners, and according to Cassius Dio, the horse was fed oats mixed with gold flour lakes and also possibly a priest. Uh, now, a lot of this is left up to debate, and a number of historians will argue that this was nothing more than a prank at the expense of the Senate. While never officially made a consul, this horse has lived on in infamy, inspiring a number of fictional depictions in modern media, including the metal band Caligula's Horse. Regardless of the official status of the horse, the truth seems to be that this was nothing more than an attempt to mock his senators, but what a method of mockery. Number 10, 
three fights and a funeral. This first point is still up for debate as many historians are still trying to confirm how this whole gladiator thing started, but one possible launching point for these bloody Olympics was a blood rite at funerals. They served as a kind of violent eulogy, so instead of standing up in front of the mourning families and reading, I don't know, like a haiku or a poem, they uh, fought out their feelings. Healthy. When esteemed aristocrats died, families would hold bouts between slaves beside the grave. Like right there, front row seat for the corpse. This was to demonstrate the virtues that were demonstrated by the dead in life. This presentation of blood in battle also could have stood in for human sacrifice. As you can guess, the tradition would gather quite the crowd and eventually evolved into the epic gladiator battles we know today. Julius Caesar, for instance, organized a massive gladiator fight between hundreds of warriors to honor the death of his father. By the end of the first century BC, the gladiator games were state funded and much, much larger. Number nine, no heckling. When the Colosseum was built in 80 AD, about 50 to 80,000 fans of Roman combat, they would pour in. The energy was high. This was their only source of entertainment, really. They weren't watching The Witcher season two back then, so you know, they had to do this. So some fans would get so into the action that they, of course, would heckle. Well, just like a comedy show, they too can hear you heckle. You're throwing off their entire performance and that's a no-go. Today, a 21-year-old usher will politely ask you to keep it down, but in Roman Colosseum days, you don't get a warning. One of Rome's more violent emperors, Domitian, was pretty die-hard when it came to the Colosseum and the games. So much so that one day, a guy in the crowd heckled a gladiator, probably talked smack about his oiled up abs, or you know, smile, that's always a fun one, we hear that a lot. So Domitian had him pulled from the audience to the center of the arena where a group of aggressive dogs finished him off. How terrifying is that? No heckling, ever, even now, stop. Hey Taylor, yeah? stop. Number eight, vegetarians. So believe it or not, the diet of a gladiator was largely vegetarian, though it wasn't really like they had any choice. It was expensive to keep these fearsome warriors and meat wasn't always easy to come by, so they had to fill in the gap with other sources. Based on the excavation of 22 gladiators, their bones revealed that their typical food was wheat, barley, and beans. How they could tell this from their bones, no idea. Science, man. There was little sign of any meat or even dairy as well. However, they did drink another kind of mysterious substance. This study was carried out by the Medical University of Vienna in Austria and the University of Bern in Switzerland. And not only did it reveal the aforementioned vegetarian diets, it also showed evidence that they consumed a health boosting tonic made out of plant ashes. It can be compared to the way we consume magnesium tablets or vitamin C. It was believed that it helped restore gladiators after a battle. Now, obviously, 22 is a pretty small sample size, but hey, that's still at least that percentage, so. Number seven, death before combat. With most of these Roman gladiators, they are trained, they understand a specific style of combat, and they're paired off with an opponent that's somewhat equal. But not all of these gladiators are UFC fighters. Not all of them are Russell Crowe, okay? A great amount of gladiators were criminals who were forced to fight each other in the name of entertainment. These prisoners of war were not really on board with fighting a lion with a dagger. They understood that this was probably a one-way trip, so many of them took their own lives before the combat even began. This one story is haunting, but it makes total sense. 29 prisoners were all set to fight these crazy animal battles in front of thousands, but they all ended up strangling each other. They took each other's lives because that was easier to them than walking into this night Nightmare. That's horrible. The reason this was an easier choice to make was because saying no would lead to an even more painful and still public execution. Number six, aphrodisiac. The fanaticism around gladiator warriors was like the fanfare around the Beatles, the Stones, and Justin Bieber, like all around, all combined. You might even argue that they were some of the very first celebrities, and that was mostly due to their sex appeal. They were sex bombs. Ooh, ooh, beefy men. Yeah. Roman women believed that even their sweat was an aphrodisiac, like Old Spice deodorant. The gladiators won massive fame and even had their own action figures as children would make their clay dolls emanating their favorites. Their image would be placed on walls in public spaces and even endorsed products. Women wore hair jewelry dipped in gladiator blood or mixed their sweat into hair cream or cosmetics. To have a dream about one was said to foretell a fortunate marriage. There was even graffiti in Pompeii that depicted one fighter who would catch women in his nets at night. Like a sexy boogeyman. Ooh, 
Number five, blindfolded. Remember that last scene in the movie Dodgeball when Vince Vaughn blindfolds himself and then still wins somehow? What a moment in time. There were no dry eyes in the entire theater. But what if I told you gladiators would also pull this trick off? Yeah, in order to get crowds to return to these massive death events, they would need to change the formula up from time to time. Sometimes they would have cheap beer nights, which helped, but a new idea that worked was referred to as andabada, where gladiators wore blindfolds during combat. They would also leave the armor inside. Yeah, sometimes just battling in sandals and cloth. And you thought Marco Polo made you anxious. Mm. They would save these events for the more brutal criminals, so people weren't just forced to, you know, wrap up their eyes and shake their legs into an arena. It was, you know, they were bad, so it's kind of like, mm, it was fine, I guess. Number four, women fought as gladiators. This was news to me. I wouldn't do it because tiny. Uh, as we might have already established, gladiators were usually built from slaves, warriors, and sometimes even volunteers. Good for you. And apparently women were not exempt from that. Female slaves were quite frequently condemned to face their fate in the arena, though some volunteered because, you know, there were Xena warriors. Some of the time it was as genuine contenders, while some were sent simply for the entertainment or embarrassment. Emperor Dominion, for example, loved to pit women against people with dwarfism because he thought it was funny. Neither the women or the little people were taken seriously, as few appeared to have proven themselves in combat. However, some still did, rest assured. The timeline as to when they started doing this is unclear, but there are records of at least two women referred to as Amazon and Achillea. Epic names, right? Whoa. They are depicted on a marble relief dating back to the second century AD, and it says that they fought in an honorable draw. Women also joined in the animal hunts, but by 200 AD, their participation ended when Emperor Septimus Severus banned them in the games. Damn you, Severus Snape. Number three, nets for weapons. When you're walking into that arena, you're eyeing down this eight foot six beast in front of you. He has like 12 abs. It doesn't look good. His name's Gore or something terrifying. You're gonna want a Nerf bat or two. You're gonna want a weapon. Now, weapons in the Colosseum were a necessity, of course, but can you believe some gladiators would use nets to fight? Nets. Oh. Yes. Yeah, nets, like they're catching butterflies or co-hosts. This class was referred to as the Ritari. Now their combat style was built around the ways of fishermen. Yeah, Popeye versus Maximus, place your bets, people. Realistically, these warriors looked a lot more like Aquaman. They would fight with a trident and a net. They would take their time. They would avoid these mighty swings from these big dudes. And then when the time was right, they would just go and then they would just poke the shit out of them with a trident over and over in hopes that it would, you know, end. It helps to be quick, but if you've seen Game of Thrones, you know that spears don't always work. Number two, are you not entertained? Great title, I know. Fun fact, gladiators for the most part didn't actually try and kill each other in the ring, just like wound. Yeah, take a second to digest that beside the Hollywood movies you know and love. But the truth was gladiators had a code they had to follow and killing each other wasn't a part of it. Why? Well, because Gladiators were expensive investments, and seeing your prize fighter that you've like forked hundreds and thousands of dollars into die in a fight would hurt your wallet big time. Also, most of them knew each other and were besties, so they didn't even want to. Contests were usually single combat between two even opponents, and referees oversaw the whole thing. If one got injured enough, the ref would probably just, you know, call it. Often enough, the bout would end after both participants gave an entertaining show and would leave with honor. They were like, yeah, you're entertained. Good, we're good to go, right? Cool. However, their life expectancy was still short. Historians estimate that gladiators had one in five or one in 10 chance of ending up dead after the bout, either from being killed or wounded, gangrene, you know the whole deal. And finally, coming in at number one spot, naval battles. Okay, so I mentioned the Aquaman gladiators with the nets and the, you know, pokey poke tridents. That's absolutely insane. But have you heard about the staged naval battles? What a spectacle this would have been. The Colosseum was once flooded, which I'm sure took a hot minute or two. Then these ships would come out and then it would be like medieval times, but with a splash zone, right? These ships were designed to resemble these vessels from famous battles, but the bottom of the ship was flat because the water was only five feet deep. Can't have the bottom of the ship scraping against all that sand and 
bones and stuff. No, you'll get stuck. The water was only five feet deep, so obviously they couldn't use real ships. It wasn't always violent reenactments either. Sometimes they would fill the Colosseum and nude synchronized swimmers would come out. Nice, nothing like an in-ground pool filled with gladiator bones. Also, goggles weren't invented until the 14th century, so yuck. These naval battles were doing so well that Emperor Domitian devoted an entire lake to them. It's kind of like Harry Potter Goblet of Fire. They would just go to this lake and then watch these insane battles or performances, you know? Hashtags. Slytherin, I don't know. Once the shows moved over there permanently, they then used the floodgates and trapdoors to hide animals inside of. What a nice upgrade. What a show. Also, this is terrifying. At number 10, lifestyle. Ancient Roman slaves experienced different lifestyles and living conditions based on a number of factors, often linked to their occupations. Slaves who didn't have a specific skill or trade were often used in mines and agriculture, and those were the harshest conditions that they could have been subjected to. Oftentimes, they were literally worked to death, and since they didn't have any human rights in the eyes of the Romans, they were often overlooked and simply replaced. On the other hand, household slaves received more humane treatment. They were treated better by their masters, and sometimes they were able to get some money in order to buy their freedom. If they were able to buy their freedom, the slaves would become freedmen, which was a social class between slaves and free people. Before we continue discussing the hard lives of slaves in ancient Rome, make sure you guys smash that thumbs up button if you're thoroughly entertained so far, and maybe even consider subscribing to the channel to see more videos like this one. At number 8, Spartacus. At one point, a group of Roman slaves revolted, and though they eventually lost lost their battle, they survived a pretty long time thanks to one famous slave named Spartacus. Spartacus was a slave who escaped a gladiatorial training camp and recruited thousands of other slaves to fight for their freedom alongside him. For the slaves, Spartacus was their symbol of hope and their leader. This slave army was able to defy Roman authorities for two years with freedom in their sights, but unfortunately those dreams were crushed when Roman general Crassus crushed Spartacus and his army. After Spartacus was killed, the authorities came for the rest of the slaves in the army and they were severely punished. 6,000 slaves who took part in the revolt were crucified, and this was almost a warning to the other slaves against trying to revolt again. Spartacus became a legend, but it wasn't enough to free the Roman slaves. At number 7, Ownership In ancient Rome, slavery and slave ownership was such a common practice that pretty much everyone owned slaves, regardless of social status. Even some of the poorest Roman citizens would own one or two slaves. Obviously, the more money you had back then, the more slaves you could afford. In Roman Egypt, the average artisan owned about two or three slaves each. Emperor Nero was known to have owned over 400 slaves who lived and worked in his home in the city, but his numbers are eclipsed by a wealthy Roman named Gaius Caecilius Isidorus, who according to historical records owned 4,166 slaves at the time of his death. That just gives you an idea of just how many people were sold into slavery in the first place. At number 9, Population it's pretty messed up just how many slaves there were in ancient Rome. In their society, wealthy people owned dozens if not hundreds of slaves to do their menial work. In ancient Rome, anyone could be sold into slavery. No matter your race or background, if you could work, you could be bought and sold. Historians believe that about 90% of the free people in Italy by the 1st century BCE had ancestors who were slaves. At one point, the Roman Senate debated having slaves wear uniforms to be able to distinguish them from the rest of society, but they ultimately decided against it when they realized just how many slaves there were. One ancient Roman politician once said, quote, It was once proposed in the Senate that slaves should be distinguished from free people by their dress. But then it was realized how great and dangerous this would be if our slaves began to count us. End quote. They literally couldn't afford to let the slaves know how many other slaves there were, because if they would have known they outnumbered the other members of society, this could have led to a revolt. I mean, there were slave revolts regardless, but we will get to that later. At number six, freedom. Earlier, I mentioned that Roman slaves had the chance to buy their freedom. It was a lengthy process, but this gave a lot of slaves hope for a better life. Things weren't always better after buying their freedom though, and many of them sold themselves back into slavery because things were tough. The process of buying your freedom as a slave was called manumission. This could be achieved in a number of ways. Slave master could grant their slave freedom as a reward for their service and loyalty. The slave could pay their master a sum of money to be freed, or sometimes a slave master could just find it convenient to let their slave go. Most slave masters who chose that last option to free their slave for their own benefit were merchants who needed someone to be able to sign contracts on their behalf, and since slaves weren't allowed to represent their masters from a legal standpoint, they would be freed, but would still work for their master. You also had to be over the age of 30 to buy your freedom, so if you were lucky 
to live that long, then there was hope of being freed. But with the average life expectancy in ancient Rome being about 28 years or so, and with the living conditions of many slaves, they would be lucky to get that opportunity. At number five, demand. In ancient Rome, there was an incredibly high demand for slaves, but since there were so many slaves in Rome, there was always work for them. Oftentimes, people sold themselves or their children into slavery in order to pay off their debts, so when it came to being bought, that came pretty easy. Other than public office, slaves were used for almost every activity in ancient Rome. The most common slave trade was mining because workers were always in demand, mostly due to the high level of danger that came with the job and the fact that many slaves were injured or died while working in the mines, and slave masters needed to keep replacing those who could no longer work. Domestic labor and farming were also high demand jobs for slaves back then. Back then, the logic behind using slave labor for these types of jobs was that, quote, free labor should be used in unhealthy places. End quote. Basically, they believed that it was better to have a slave pass away on the job than a free person because it would impact their business less. At number four, procurement. The way that slaves were acquired in ancient Rome was pretty messed up, I will say. Typically, slaves were acquired through four different ways. They would be brought in as war captives, as victims of pirate raids, by trade, or by breeding. During the early expansion of the Roman Empire, many war captives were turned into slaves. The pirates from Sicilia, located in what is now modern day Turkey, did business with the Romans and supplied them with a lot of their slaves. The pirates would bring their slaves to the island of Delos, which back then was considered considered to be the international center of slave trading. The slave trade was such a big deal back then that it has been recorded that on at least one occasion, 10,000 people were traded as slaves and shipped back to Italy in one day. This was a big business opportunity for a lot of people, but of course, no one ever considered the lives of the people they were buying and selling. At number three, fugitives. As you can imagine, life as a slave in ancient Rome or at any period of time wasn't easy. Living conditions were poor, it was dangerous, and no one should ever be treated like that or used for free labor. Many slaves have been known to escape and obviously the same went for those in ancient Rome. Slaves running away from their masters was a common thing back then, and to deal with it, slave owners would hire professional slave catchers to hunt down, capture, and return the escaped slave back to their owner. For slave owners who wanted to take matters into their own hands, they would advertise rewards for those who could return their slaves, or they would just try and locate their slave themselves. Some slave owners had ways of preventing their slaves from getting away, like using collars with instructions on where to return the escaped slave, much like a dog collar, which is just dehumanizing. At number two, revolts. In Roman times, slave revolts were pretty common. There have been a number of recorded slave revolts in Roman history. I mentioned the one that was led by Spartacus, but there's another pretty famous Roman slave revolt that was led by a man named Eunice. Eunice led a revolt that happened in Sicily from 135 to 132 BCE. It is said that Eunice believed himself to be a prophet and claimed to have several mystical visions. Eunice was able to persuade a number of other slaves to follow him when he performed a trick where sparks and flames came out of his mouth. They believed that he was magical and so they followed him to try and fight back against the Roman forces. Unfortunately, they were defeated, but the example that they set is believed to have inspired yet another slave revolt in Sicily later in 104 to 103 BCE. And finally, at number one, totally normal. Probably the most messed up thing about life as a Roman slave was just how normal slavery was in society. I mean, the Roman people were so invested in their slaves that they continuously tried to crush their revolts and they tried everything in their power to keep them from escaping. Even the sheer number of slaves that were in their society just shows how important slavery was to them. Back then, slavery was just an unquestioned institution. For many, it was just a normal part of life, which is actually quite frightening when you think about it. There is no recorded history of Romans ever questioning slavery in their society, and all economic, legal, and social forces in Rome at this time worked hard to try and preserve slavery as part of their society. To the ancient Romans, slaves were seen as the direct opposite of free people, which they believed was a necessary balance that they needed in their society. They never completely got rid of slavery either. Though they did try and create new rules and laws to make life as a slave more bearable, they were still bought and sold into servitude and were seen as property and lesser people. Number 10, the blade, the wife, and the horse. If you love something, you gotta let it go. Or how about parading your naked wife in front of your friends in the mighty Roman military? Emperor Caligula was so impressed with his wife's beauty, he just thought he had to share it. 
even though apparently she wasn't that attractive and already had children with another man. Scandalous. If she had wheels, she'd be the town bike, if you know what I'm saying. As if displaying your wife's gratuitous curves isn't scandalous enough, apparently he would use very real threats as a strange way of flirting. Clearly this was a dude who's got some issues. Like for example, the one time he wanted to humiliate the Roman Senate by claiming to make his horse a council. Although he didn't actually go through with it. Still though, this one's all sixes and nines, innit? This may have been related to a brothel caught disease. He might he might have had syphilis, I'm just saying. That's my Number nine, no grain. Max Minimus Thrax was like most Roman emperors. Seized power when he wanted, seized land when he wanted, pretty much did whatever he wanted. Strangely enough, however, he cut subsidies for grain. This was one of the many tactics to help up cover for increased taxes. Taxes that were imposed because he had doubled the pay of the military during constant military action. That's a lot of coins needed. Eventually, the people had had enough. And ironically, his own guards poked him with spears until he couldn't be poked anymore. I'm not a military expert or anything, but if you're gonna wage war, you gotta have the money for it. It's kind of like when the ice cream truck comes around and you're counting quarters for a large chocolate cone because you're 12 and life is hard and you deserve it. I love the ice cream truck. Number eight, Red Roman. Emperor Caracalla was also like many other Roman emperors, as he was quite bloodthirsty and honestly just a bad dude. He had allied his brother Geta just because he didn't like him. Good reason, I guess. Then 20,000 of his brother's followers persecuted and killed. When some good folks heard about this terrible news and were horrified, rightfully so, I mean who wouldn't be, they too were dealt with in a non-YouTube conduct safe way. He depleted the treasury from war and let foreigners have Roman citizenship. Now I know that sounds like a good thing, but it isn't. In already trying times, it completely messed up Roman societal culture. In a sense, fire is good, it allows us many things. But Carcola threw a whole jerry can of gasoline on the fire by doing that. When your society is built on one thing, perhaps it's a good idea to not totally flip that upside down overnight, as quick decisions like that lead to quick downfalls. Just saying though, just, just saying. Number seven, the light of my life. Emperor Nero was straight up just not a cool guy. This whole list could be about him, but I'm here to make you laugh, not horrify you with the horrors of Pax Romana. Nero, like most emperors, was very wealthy, the kind of wealth that only people who shop at Whole Foods can understand. As it turns out, there was a fire in Rome at the time, burned for a long time, pretty, pretty big deal. Who started the fire? Uh, no one really knows, even though Nero himself might be a suspect. However, it would be really easy to get rid of a group of people you don't like if you blame it on them. So it was blamed on the hot new religion at the time, you gotta love them, Christians, except Nero didn't, and he was kind of egotistical, so in order to punish the scapegoat of Christians, he had them set ablaze, so there was more light in his garden, so to speak, or that's what is said, at least. I know sometimes we can all disagree with our faith, but lighting each other on fire is not the answer. Mom always said if you have nothing nice to say, then don't light people on fire. Okay, Mom. Number six, not so Hercules. Commodus was like many other emperors in thinking that he was very close to the gods, but Commodus thought he was a Greek god and reincarnated Hercules to be exact. So much so that he would often take up a role as a gladiator, which a lot of Romans thought was scandalous as a leader. A leader shouldn't be dealing with the barbarians at our gates and other lands that were persecuting and invading and taking over rather than performing in blood sports. It was thought that this was below the office of the emperor. Rumors began to stir that because of his love for the arena, he may not be the royal bloodline claimed to be. When in the arena, his adversaries always surrendered. So. He always won. In return, he wouldn't kill them, to be fair, just scarred them as it was seen to be a good thing to be bested by the emperor and then to leave with a mark. Sure, we'll go with that. Apparently, they also brought animals in for him to slaughter in the arena for entertainment. Eventually, people had enough of him wasting time and money playing gladiator games. And he was strangled by his coach. Oh, hey coach, I'm ready for the next match. How you doing? Hey, what? why are you looking at me like that, man? What's wrong? And, and what's that rope for? Number five, last best hope. Romulus Augustulus was the last emperor of the Western Roman Empire. History gets kind of crazy after this point, but let's be real, what's more scandalous than being the last ruler of your empire? 
Could he have saved it? Would the world have looked different if he did? Truth be told, not a lot of records survived his reign, so we don't really know. Perhaps it's because he didn't have much time to write things down. Or maybe because he was still a minor when he inherited the failing Roman Empire. Or really, it was because Rome's worst nightmare had come true. The barbarians at the gates had taken over Rome. The German barbarian general, Odoker took over and claimed himself to be the king of Italy, which ushered in the end of the great western Roman Empire. Talk about scandal. Number 4. Excess, excess, excess. Emperor Elagabalus is what I think of when I think of a Roman emperor. Someone who is pampered in a time where most people don't have access to really anything easily. Eating grapes off the vine, bottles of wine, and your servants are looking fine. Alright, alright, alright. His life of decadence was also matched with a classic level of unaliving those who oppose you or rather groups that you feel need to be persecuted. Even more scandalous than that is the question of his sexuality. Oh. While being debated by historians today, there are rumors that the decadent emperor may have been having a relationship with his male chariot driver. There's also rumors of the emperor wearing women's clothes. Very scandalous indeed, oh handsome emperor. Number 3. Senate Purge I am the Senate. Said Tiberius knowing that he had a really cool name. While not the worst emperor on this list, he did purge the Senate in times of political unrest. Just like everyone's favorite space emperor and one of my worst impressions. He wasn't a popular choice for the job as he really only came to power through a series of misfortunes. All of this leads to a lackluster leader who when he retired to an island off the coast of Italy, rewarded his mediocre work with some stuff to do with younger people that uh, I just can't say on YouTube. Apparently, he became a heavy drinker and got himself involved in all kinds of vices. It is speculated that Emperor Caligula was a child on this island and may have witnessed this debauchery. It's speculated that this may have influenced his acts of sin and honestly not sure what to call as these guys, I mean these guys are, I don't know what you call this, these guys are all messed up man, I don't know, they're just crazy. Number 2. No Holidays Septimus Severus sounds like a brothel related disease in the Harry Potter universe. But actually, he was a traditional guy. He liked things Roman and wanted to keep it that way. So, when the Jewish and Christian faith made their way to Rome, he wasn't a happy guy. So he had them persecuted. The only thing saving these people from a short Roman sword was if they worshipped the emperor and the emperor gods as well. For some reason, that made him a little more forgiving. However, considering he wasn't the only emperor to feel this way, I would think again before decorating a Christmas tree or lighting a menorah in Rome. Of course, I'm only making humor of what probably was an awful time for those religious factions. We like to romanticize Rome, but she's not all perfect. Number 1. Eye for an Eye Empress Irene of the Eastern Roman Empire may have been a woman, but was just as ruthless and bloodthirsty as her male counterparts. While a lot of people probably had an issue with her leading as a woman, I'd like to hope more people today have a problem with her politics and how she came to power. A little unaliving here, cozying up over there, playing the game until she got what she wanted. And there was this one time that she wasn't too happy with her son's politics and it was likely he was going to have her power removed so he needed to go on a timeout. She had some guards gouge his eyes out which mortally wounded him. No big deal or anything. I guess there was no timeout corner back then. I went to Rome to the chief's palace. He bestowed upon me this wisdom after learning about Irene. That ain't it. Kicking off the list at number 10, Gladiator Blood. Okay, nice and thirsty this morning, so let's talk about gladiator blood so we can get nice and hydrated for this video. When Charlie Sheen started talking smack about drinking dragon blood, everybody looked at him like this guy was insane. But back then, back in ancient Roman days, if you boasted about drinking gladiator blood, that's great, you were on the right track. Something's, something's working for you, pal. Keep it up. Ancient Romans believed that gladiators had the literal heart of a lion, and to be fair, they were in immaculate shape and they looked like lions with their glorious hair. I'm attracted to Romans, uh, most of them. So the thought process here being extremely superstitious was that if you drank said gladiator blood, whatever disease you had would soon be cured. Yes, the strong heart of a lion, blood. Yeah, if you have some epilepsy, uh, Roman physicians would tell you to drink some blood, like you're a vampire. Yeah, here you go. Here you go, Edward, enjoy, hope you feel better. Number nine, you're in trouble. Recently we did a list on dark medical practices used in history and in that list we mentioned briefly about how urine was used by ancient Romans to whiten their smile. Yeah, fresh breath, not guaranteed actually this time at all, it's really not, it's the opposite. In fact, 
Well, to dive deeper into this gross, disgusting fact, ancient Romans also used urine to wash their clothes. Yep. <laughs> That's so gross. I was like, I hope, I hope no one peeing on them. Here we go. After they were done washing up, they would mask the smell, or at least try to, with uh, leaves. Yeah, they would use bay leaves. Yeah, they didn't use soap because, well, the amount of ammonia in urine did the trick, so there was no need at that point. Yeah. Lye was also used to clean clothes at this time, but it was too pricey. So plan B was to head down to the, you know, washrooms, the old ancient laundromat. Same thing, really, they're pretty close. And then everybody would catch up while, you know, stomping and urinating and cleaning out their clothes. It was, it was a good time. Number eight, new hair, new me. As soon as I cut my hair, I'm not gonna lie, I felt great. There's less weight on the neck, I could be more free in my silly movements when I do these lists. Glowing up these days is easier than ever. You know, the tutorials on YouTube as well, you can learn how to do your brows while hearing true crime. It's amazing what we have nowadays. The Romans, not that easy. They had to do a little more work back then. If you were an ancient Roman and you wanted to show off the new you to your ex, maybe you're at a vomitorium party and you, and you see your ex maybe perhaps, how would you dye your hair? How would you get their attention? How do you show Romulus that blondes do in fact do it better, right? Romans would have to use goat fat and beech wood ashes to bring out those highlights, yeah. Maybe it's goat fat, maybe it's Maybelline, maybe it's disgusting. It's definitely disgusting. Again, like those crazy Roman parties, this was a symbol of status, right? If your hair didn't reek of goat fat, um, who are you? <laughs> You're not on the list, honey. Goat fat or bust, I don't speak broke. See ya. Emperor Claudius, his third wife, Valeria, apparently she once dyed her hair blonde and painted her entire body gold, and then had a contest to see who could hook up with the most Romans in one night. Yeah, Bachelor in Paradise, Pompeii edition. Tune in, it's night at eight. Number seven, party hard. The term boot and rally was added to the Urban Dictionary back in 2002, pretty recent. But Romans, they were doing that a long time ago. They were riding that wave out a long, long time ago. They were ahead of the game. They knew how to get down. All those ancient parties, well, rather, they knew how to get it back up. Ancient Romans would often make themselves throw up in order to continue eating and drinking because it was a social status. Yeah, what would normally be a red flag at a house party was a sign of respect back then. But it was business. These parties were literally business meetings. These long, exhausting banquets. Attending these was a sign of social standing. So you wanted to be around the longest. You wanted to drink the most. You wanted to dance the most. And you wanted to ideally puke the most. Those are the coolest Romans in town, right? You ever see a Roman gagging? You know, he's, he's getting some stuff done in the city. Ah, oh, he's like, oh, excuse me. <laughs> oh. The solution back then was to throw it up and then continue. So you can, you know, excuse yourself from dinner, go to the vomitorium, right across from the dining room. How convenient, must be a nice breeze rolling through there, I'm sure. But then you would go to this room, grab a feather, and then tickle, oh, thy throat, and then make room for even more lobster. Yeah, they have a thing that holds uh, feathers. So you just go in and go, oh, a blue one. And then you shove it down your mouth, and then put it back in. After you dry it off first, you gotta put it back in. Number six, bathroom hangouts. Bathroom lighting is key when you go out, okay? Those 1 a.m. selfies have to look good. That's the whole point, or else why are we going out? Why am I putting on shoes, right? The curls aren't working, I'm not going outside, that's it. In ancient Roman times, hanging out in the bathroom with your friends was common. They didn't have any neon lights or anything cool. They didn't have Arctic monkeys playing or any cool atmospheres. It was just a lot of bricks. And also, it of course smelled really bad. They didn't have the Charmin Ultra less is more lifestyle either. They had to use sticks with sponges to wipe. And yeah, they also, same with the feathers, they had to share said sticks. Socializing in these ancient toilets was like socializing at a Starbucks. It was normal, it was, Business, you know, you would spend hours here and you got stuff done. Groups of Romans would discuss business, politics, military strategies, you name it. All the while, there's a dude in the corner just taking a sh <laughs> Romans believed the goddess Glochina was the guardian of the toilet drain system. Gloca Maxima translates to big drain. So when you invent the flushing toilet, yeah, you, you're obviously, you're like, this is some higher power. You can call your toilets whatever you want, you know? Just maybe don't call any more meetings there because uh, it smells a little bad. Number five, no soap. Look, sometimes you're in a rush, you don't have time to shower, so you do the classic Axe Body Spray X, you know? The old one, two. Do you remember that, Chris? Oh, yeah. It's yeah. so cold, too, on the armpits. Wow. Yeah, like, yo, no wonder I can't grow armpit hair. I've been spraying, like, aerosol. I've been spraying spray paint on my armpits every morning since I was, like, nine. I still use it sometimes. Axe Chocolate? 
No contest, so good. Ancient Romans, they were way ahead of the game. They didn't clean their clothes with laundry detergent like I mentioned earlier. It's not shocking to hear that they also didn't use soap to wash their bodies. No, instead, they rubbed perfume oil all over themselves to get rid of sweat and all that jazz. But later on, once said oil had dried up, they then removed it with a wooden wedge or spatula, a tool called a strigil, and they just peel it off. I kind of like that idea. Whenever I burn in the summer, I'm like, ooh, let me peel this neck slowly. It's the world's most painful loofah, essentially. Dirt and sweat would get stuck to this oil and then subsequently peeled off. So it worked, but it took a little more time than our showers nowadays. For Romans who were well off, this of course was a whole event. There were several, you know, assistants. You could pick all these fancy fragrant oils. It was slow and sensual. It was like fun, dare I say. How is anybody ever on time? Like, oh, sorry I was late. You know, those, those oil baths I had to stick around for four hours this morning and get peeled. It's crazy. Number four, Roman art. This one reminds me of Superbad a lot, and you'll understand why. Back in the 18th century, when excavations took place in the city of Pompeii, they found lots and lots of art, all with a similar theme. A similar, everything looked like a certain body part. An eggplant-ish theme. There were carvings in the streets, there were carvings of these things in the walls, under a street sign, you name it. They're just everywhere. Just rich history carved in all over. We're still finding these uh, today. They're called the phalluses of Pompeii. Yeah, imagine tripping over one of these. Then you do that thing where you look back to see what you almost rolled your ankle on. You look back and see that. You're like, oh, what? Some dude in Pompeii got you like thousands of years ago. Just chiseling out a... Many tour guides like to say that they all point and lead to a brothel when in reality, that's a lie. These were all just for good luck. These symbols were to ward off the evil eye. Most folks kept these outside the front of their homes, right next to the mailbox. <laughs> Coming with mail, you're like... Number three, animals in the Colosseum. In order to spice up the classic fight and clash swords till someone's not alive anymore, sometimes gladiators would be put in the arena with an animal instead of another human being to, you know, spice it up, just to spice up those Saturday night shows, I guess. People are crazy. Were they squirrels? Or were they tigers, elephants, bears, leopards, lions, hyenas, or wolves? The latter, it was all the scary big animals. Animals were very expensive, so they weren't used every day, but the organizers of these battles would go all out for the fights that did include them. Everyone would pile in. It's kind of like Logan Paul versus Mayweather, you know, these big social events were like, well, what else are we doing, you know? Let's go watch. Most animals that were used in these great battles unfortunately didn't make it out alive. That's the horrible part. I'm a big animal lover, so that's hard to read. This led to other important factors down the road. People loved when animals were included that eventually trade in exotic animals took place. That's where it all started. This quickly took the hippo from the Nile, for example, and then made them extinct. That's how they did that. Cut to today, thousands of species are going extinct more and more. You know what, let's just bring gladiators back. Let's just do it. UFC, put them in armor. Let's just see what happens. That'd be hilarious. Release all the animals from zoos and then bring back just gladiators. Life, life will be fixed. Number two, naval battles. Have you ever heard about staged naval battles in the Colosseum? It's a weird spectacle, but it wouldn't have been that crazy. It sounds a lot bigger and more lavish than it really was. The Colosseum was flooded at this point, which I'm sure took a hot minute, and then these ships would come out, and then it would be like medieval times almost, but with a splash zone, a really dirty splash zone. These ships were designed to resemble vessels from famous battles before, but the bottom of the ship was flat, right? These were fake boats, obviously. The water was only five feet deep, so obviously they couldn't use you know, real ships or anything like that. It was all show. It wasn't always violent reenactments either though, as funny as that sounds when you think of the Roman Colosseum. Sometimes they would fill the Colosseum and have nude, synchronized swimmers as a show. Imagine that, imagine traveling the land and then you get there, you're like, oh, let's watch some action. And it's just like ballet. And they're like, oh, this is actually quite nice. I like this a lot. Yeah, also goggles weren't invented until the 14th century. So they had to swim underwater like, oh, this is so gross. Their poor eyes. These naval stories were doing so well that Emperor Domitian devoted an entire lake to them now, like the Goblet of Fire. People would walk to a lake to watch these insane shows. Only once the shows moved over there permanently, they then used the Colosseum's old floodgates to hide those animals in. So it was, you know, we love upgrades, I guess. It sucks, it all, it, it's all bad. And finally, number one, audience troubles. Okay, what's it like watching these ancient Colosseum shows? Was it fun? Was it horrifying to watch? Were you, like, the, the PTSD from these shows alone. When the Colosseum was built in 80 AD, about 50 to 80,000 fans of Roman combat would pour in often. The energy is high. This was their only entertainment. They weren't watching The Witcher season three, you know what I mean? Some fans would get so into the action that they, of course, would heckle, like we do nowadays with like UFC. 
people would be watching like, oh, throw the right hook, throw this thing. They would obviously do the same. But in Roman Colosseum days, you didn't get a warning if you heckled, you know what I mean? One of Rome's more violent emperors, Domitian, I mentioned earlier, he was pretty uh, diehard about the Colosseum and their games. So much so that one day, a guy in the crowd was heckling a gladiator so much, he was probably, you know, talking smack about his oiled up abs or something like that. So Emperor Domitian had him pulled from the audience to the center of the arena. And then he had to fight to survive. He didn't get out alive, obviously. It was all bad. So yeah, don't huckle. Don't huckle? Don't huckle or heckle. Don't huckle or heckle or heckle. How terrifying is that? Can you imagine heckling and then getting called out? Ancient Colosseum times. Hey Maximus, smile. Me? Number 10, parties of poison. Hindsight is 2020, which I find more ironic than ever since the whole thing that happened and is continuing to happen. Today we know that lead, especially in large doses, is not good. It's poison. But a lot of the pipes that the Romans used in their plumbing were made from lead. Their water had 100 times more lead in it than the water that came from the springs, which means every time they drank water, they were poisoning themselves. Some side effects include behavioral changes as well as weakening organs and vital signs, etc., which may explain some of the more questionable emperor behaviors or the fall of the Roman Empire because people got nuts. But to add insult to injury, the Romans used to sweeten their wine with something called sapa. Sapa is lead acetate, the sugar of lead, which is, and it's also a salt, which is confusing, and therefore poison. Since Romans could down as much as two liters of wine in one sitting, they were slowly poisoning themselves, first with water, then with the wine. Speaking of wine, moving on to number nine, we have you better love wine. If you're a vodka or a beer person, you might not fit in while partying with the Romans, especially if you hate wine. Wine was the lifeblood of ancient Roman parties. Wine was drunk at every stage of the Roman party, but it had to be diluted with hot or cold water. Unlike how we drink wine today, which would be crazy if you were to dilute it. Whoa. It was looked down upon to drink wine in its purest form. It was served out with ladles, usually by naked and attractive male slaves. To heat the water, the Romans used special boilers, but if you really wanted to be bougie, they would add snow to make it cold. Considering they didn't have fridges back then, imagine the lengths they would have to go to to keep the snow cold. Beyond temperature, Romans absolutely drooled for calda and mulsum. Calda was great for cold nights, it was kind of like a mold wine, it was served hot and infused with spices. Molda was infused with honey and a lot sweeter. I want to try and make both. Maybe I will on my Instagram. Let me know if I should in the comments below. Minus the lead, of course. Number eight, seating charts. If you have ever been involved in a wedding, you know how important a seating chart is. Or like even in school, when you're like assigned desks, it's a big deal. You could end up sitting next to your uncomfortable cousin or beside your smelly Aunt Sue. It could determine whether the conversation flows or it's stagnant the entire night. Ugh, hate that. Romans understood the matchmaking game when it came to banquets. It was a pretty big deal. Where you sat determined your station and overall how liked you were. They had a three couch system called the triclinium. The most honored guests would sit on the couch in the center next to the hosts on the right. But if you were on the couch on the left, it kind of meant that you weren't as big of a deal. Sorry. Eventually as parties got bigger, so did the three couch rule extend to a huge semicircular couch in the middle that could hold about 12 people. Number seven, gladiator fights. We just did a video on this, Taylor and I, go check it out. Now, parties weren't just about eating, drinking, and socializing, there had to be entertainment, of course. Roman parties were designed around the five senses, taste, touch, smell, sight, and hearing. So of course, there were the ancient Roman bards jamming out some earworms, but what was there to look at? You could only watch someone play the harp for so long. Next up on the entertainment list was acrobats, dancing girls, even mimes, which I was surprised to learn, plus trained exotic animals. If you were more like the charcuterie and like a quiet evening kind of person, you might enjoy poetry readings. But what really got the party started was an epic gladiatorial battle. Nothing like putting sharp objects in drunk people's hands. But that wasn't all they did. Parties were a big deal and nobles loved to outdo each other, so sometimes they went too far. More than once it got out of hand, but the most famous was during the reign of Emperor Elagabalus. He wanted to shower his dinner guests with flowers, so he built a full ceiling filled with them, but the flowers somehow ended up smothering some of his guests to death because he just kind of went overboard. Death by roses. 
That's a poem title right there. Stick to poetry nights, my friends. Number six, Saturnalia. One of the most popular Roman festivals, it was kind of like an early Christmas celebration, kind of. Except it wasn't at all, it was actually about the god Saturn, not Christ. Oops, but it did take place in December. December 17th, to be precise, for three days. But people loved it so much, it soon got extended to seven, a whole week. All work and businesses were suspended, so better do your shopping on the 16th. Slaves were even temporarily free to do as they pleased, even moral restrictions were eased. A mock king was chosen, and candles, wax fruit, wax statues were all given as presents. The practice of candle giving was to symbolize the sun returning after the winter solstice. A statue of Saturn bound at the feet would be untied and invited to join the party. The houses were adorned with wreaths and greenery, kind of like Christmas, and singing, dancing, gambling were all common features. So kind of like Mardi Gras and Christmas combined. Number five, the Black Banquet. A prank that went down in history. Don't worry, this is nothing like GOT's red wedding. Thank goodness. Emperor Dominion had a pretty sick sense of humor and decided to host a party about it. In 90 AD, he invited a crowd of aristocrats to a banquet at Palatine Hill. When they arrived, the entire palace was decorated in black. Black velvet drapes, marble, everything was painted black like the Rolling Stones song. Even the food was black and everything was illuminated by funeral lamps. Naked serving boys were painted from head to toe in black paint and served food and drink to all the guests. When they sat down, their place marks were, were tombs with their names on it and instead of lush couches, they sat on cement slabs. So basically he was like, yeah, sit in your own grave. Dominion had killed several senators in the past so everyone believed that they were never gonna get out of there alive. It was like a huge metaphor for their own deaths. The emperor himself babbled about death and decay the entire night. So after the party was over and the guests made it home with their necks intact, Dominion sent gift baggies with their tombstones and onyx plates and a now clean serving boy ready to do their bidding. Turns out the whole thing was a prank and the emperor was back at the palace laughing his butt off. Number four, Bacchanalia. The party that was so wild, it got banned. One word, orgies. The Romans dug that kind of kinky shindig, but they like to pretend they didn't. Bacchanalia, the back guy, is a term used to describe a drunken, debaucherous party at frat houses or sororities, which isn't far off from the heyday. The Bacchanal celebrates the god Dionysus, also known as Bacchus, literally the god of wine and a damn good time. The celebration could include massive feasts, ritual parades and performances, and people carrying clusters of grapes around, and of course, wine. Lots and lots of wine. It used to just be held by women three times a year, but soon men were slowly admitted to the festivities and they started making it happen about five times a month. But this was the breeding ground for scandal as it was rumored orgies and even human sacrifice occurred. So they were banned in 186 BCE, and if you ban something, you'll only make it more popular so the celebrations continued covertly. So if you're into that kind of stuff, maybe forgo the human sacrifice, but there it is. Number three, power play party. I've never lived within the aristocracy. I'm a blue collar gal. I'm never gonna know what it's like to be that rich, but I'm pretty sure this kind of who can throw the bigger party mentality hasn't really changed. In ancient Rome, parties were an opportunity to show off the amount of power a nobleman had. As soon as guests arrived, the extravagance and the rarity of the food, the vessels with which they were presented were all judged as soon as they were seen. Wine goblets and jugs had to be functional yet exquisite, made from luxurious materials like gold gold, silver, and precious stones. Back then, a middle class family could afford silverware, so imagine what the nobles could do. This display of wealth played the long game, and it could mean political favors could be made down the road. So, sneaky sneaky. Number two, Party Island. This is where it gets really dark. Ever sipped on a Capri Sun? Well, this story may taint that memory, so fair warning. The island of Capri became a rich retreat for the Roman aristocracy, known for its sadistic debauchery. Emperor Tiberius Tiberius laid claim to this island as a haven for his horrendous and horrific, horrific behavior. He brought really young, too young male and female people of the night to serve him at his villa. The island became a kind of party place with absolutely no limits. From orgies in the caves to tormenting his servants on the rack as entertainment, Tiberius seemed to be the god Pan incarnate. In fact, he acted like it too. He made all of his participants slaves dress up as nymphs and goats while performing lewd acts. The island even became known as Goat Island with Tiberius being called the Old Goat. Ugh. Unless you enjoy dangerous games and gross parties, this definitely wasn't the party island fit for anyone. 
And last but not least, number one, Caligula. Caligula's parties. Let's not go there. If you're a fan of Roman history, then you are familiar with the two most horrific emperors that ever were. One of them was Caligula. Though he started out pretty good, after an extreme bout of fever, his disposition entirely changed. Maybe it was because of the lead, we don't know. Many believed he was insane, as his cruelty knew no bounds, even when it came to joyous occasions. Caligula's thing was that he liked to embarrass the wives of his officials for some reason, and also his officials. He would force specifically married couples to his banquets, and then steal the wives away throughout the night, and then violate them against their wishes. But his torment doesn't end there. He would then relay to the entire party everything that he did in graphic detail, and enjoy the frozen shock on everyone's faces because they couldn't do anything about it. It's no wonder he was eventually assassinated. Even at a party, this guy knew how to kill the mood. He wasn't the only emperor to turn the dial on creepy, Tiberius, when the party started, but if you had to choose whose party to go to, this one plus Tiberius, both of them, just don't go near them. Go to another time frame. Just imagine it otherwise. Number 10, sea urchins. Uh, until today, I had never seen what the inside of a sea urchin looked like. I never did. That's when our most handsome boy Adam said, let me show you. Weird creatures, or at least to my North American palate they are. Very strange looking. Plus, when they were opening those bad boys up, it just looked like it was too much effort for a little bit of orange looking meat. Strange. Well, Romans being geographically located in the Mediterranean Sea found themselves around a lot of these bad boys and started to crack them open. I saw a technique with two spoons, but uh, well, I feel like a couple good bashes from a Roman sword ought to do the trick. All the things in this list, this is probably the least gross. Although, I gotta say, you see a spiky thing in the water like that, and, and the first guy was like, we should eat this. It's so weird. Why would you do this? It doesn't look edible. Number nine. Stuffed door mice. This list is going to be kind of tough even for a meat eater like me. Door mice are small rodent animals found in the old world like Europe and Africa and Asia. The old world, you get it. But just as common as your American house mouse. As it turns out, they were a favorite of Roman cuisine. Oh god, the horror. Sometimes they were even fattened up for a better meal. The recipe goes as follows, because I just know the folks at home are salivating at the mouth wanting to try this. Get your farm fresh door mouse. Empty its cavity and stuff it with an assortment of other meats and spices. Oh, beautiful, magnifique, and sometimes dipped in honey. Like stuffed jalapenos, except they're from hell. Mice are also known for not being the cleanest animals on earth, so I, I'm gonna hard pass on this one, brother. No thanks. Number eight, flamingo tongue. Excuse me, I said, looking very cute at the computer researching this topic. Curb your tongue, internet, I said. I do not believe you. Alas, as cute and as blue and innocent as my eyes are, it was true. Romans were eating flamingo tongues. Ugh. Flamingos were associated with luxury, wealth, I mean, they are a strange color, and it's close to purple. Romans love purple. And compared to the rest of the animal kingdom, it, it just doesn't really fit in. So yeah, sure, it makes sense. Well, the opulence in Rome loved flamingos and their tongues. My only hope is that they used all the birds. In my research, it said that poor citizens did when given the opportunity, but I just can't see the wealthy chopping tongues, and that's it. Hors d'oeuvres, anyone? Number seven, garum. All right, if you're like me, you're a meat and potatoes kind of guy. When I was growing up, and I probably will be until I'm 80 in a senior home, that's just the way I am. Now, that being said, you can't have hockey pucks on the barbecue without her best friend, her luscious red lover, Heinz number 57 ketchup. Am I right, Chris? Oh, of course. Exactly. And yes, mom, I can tell the difference. Thank you very much. Well, meet the Roman ketchup that would be included at a lot of meals. Almost all of them, apparently. Garum. You take fish blood and fish guts and you pack a whole bunch of salt into it and stir it up until it looked like the forbidden tomato paste. You spread that bad boy out on a wooden plank, let it dry out in the sun for a week, and uh, bada bing, bada boom, baby, you're in Rome. You got yourself an apparent delicious condiment for every meal. Apparently, it was at a lot of meals, which is. Can't imagine that being very good. Salted fish guts, woof. Number six, ostrich. I like chicken just as much as the next guy. Matter of fact, maybe I like it more than the next guy. Any chef will tell you a fresh and properly prepared chicken goes a long way. 
You can make soup, stew, pasta, fried chicken, baked barbecue, roasted chicken, casserole, chicken burgers. I mean, she's flexible. You can do a lot of stuff and she's just so versatile. Now, the question is, is ostrich as flexible? I doubt it. They were an exotic bird even back then and apparently one emperor liked to shoot their heads with arrows for fun. That was part of the fun and games. Yay. <laughs> okay. Sometimes I can't believe the stuff I read. I'd say this is probably the second least grossest thing on the list, but I don't even know where to get ostrich. And honestly, to even try, I feel like a weirdo Googling that. Where do I get ostrich meat? I don't know. It just doesn't feel right. Number five, lamb brains. Ooh, gross. Okay, lambs are not my favorite, but it's not that bad. I can see why people like it. The right preparation would yield a delicious and nutritious meal. Especially like roast it over a fire or something. I hear lamb's pretty good that way. I never had it that way, but I hear it's good. Lamb's brains, however, uh, I don't know, man. Remember that scene from Hannibal where Anthony Hopkins cuts open the skull from the guy from Goodfellas and you get to see inside his brain and how a good fella thinks? A mafia joke. Oh look, there's the prefrontal cortex. Look at all those memories of beatings and extortion. Oh wow. All jokes aside, it's a gross scene. And I can't help but not forget about it when thinking of lamb brains. Well, the Romans, they loved them. Romans enjoyed lamb brains in a variety of ways from cured, boiled, Baked, oh, and more. One of Pickiest recipe even calls for lamb brain, eggs, pepper, and rose petals. So you never have too many rose petals. Number four, sow's womb. It's exactly how it sounds. I know, it's just another part of the animal, but some pieces, well, they just don't taste like the other do. They, they kind of taste worst. And when there's no yieldy Taco Bell, your options get stretched thinner than a contortionist who's out of a job and working street corners. So it makes sense to use all the parts of the animal, which I certainly hope they are. I certainly wouldn't want any to go to waste. While not as common as other dishes on this list, you would find the sow's womb prepared with various spices and oftentimes a mixture of vinegar and honey. I don't know if those go together. I don't know if that, that's, and I think sow is, I believe is pig by the way too, sorry, I forgot to mention that, pig or a hog or something like that, sorry. Number three, giraffe. I mean, okay, such peaceful animals are just all necks. Is neck even that good to eat? I don't know. Has anyone ever had giraffe before? I, I don't know. Another animal considered to be very exotic for the time, even back then, sometimes they would even find their way into the arena to fight themselves or other animals like lions. Kinda crazy. If you've ever seen a giraffe fight before, you know how brutal they can be. It's basically who can whip their neck back and forth the hardest and the fastest. Scientists uncovering artifacts from an ancient restaurant in Pompeii found remains of a giraffe leg, so it actually may be more common than we think it was. Number two, jellyfish. Let's go in word. There's only two things I know about jellyfish. One, in SpongeBob, jellyfish produce a most delicious jelly, hence the name, and that goes on a Krabby Patty. Remember that episode? It's one of my favorites. Two, jellyfish got some nasty stingers, some of which can prove to be lethal, and no amount of Bear Grylls knowledge in urine can save you. He pees on them. I, I saw him do it once, and now I'll always remember that if I get I to pee on it, but apparently that's not how you do it. Anyway, jellyfish were most likely not eaten every day on everyone's diet. However, there are mentions of it in some Roman writings. Picasus cookbook is the best collection of ancient Roman recipes to ever survive. It mentions of a jellyfish omelet as an appetizer. Although I gotta say, I don't know if jelly and egg go together like that. I don't, Chris is saying no too. I don't, that's, that's a weird one. Number one, blood pudding. Oof. This one I know that we still eat today and some cultures love it, but there's just something about the blood for me, personally. I just, I can't get over it. I, I get lightheaded thinking about blood and the taste. Well, I'd, I think I'd rather suck on an iron girder. <laughs> well, I called the chief who was a world-class chef and he said, it ain't it. Roman blood pudding or sausage was prepared by mixing a very readily available resource of lifeblood and fat and oats to make for a very uh, loving, Tasty meal. I, oh God. Sometimes it was even put into sausage form with animal innards. Just cause, you know, go ahead, fry those, fry those bad boys up. Cook them up for me, you love the, oh, I can't even say it, dude, it's so gross. Just go ahead and cook those bad boys up. It sounds great, I promise I won't puke at the dinner table. 